So we're going to dip our toe into electrostatic, static electricity, charges that aren't allowed to move. And then in the second half of this unit, we're going to say, what if we let the charges move through wires? That's what circuitry is. We're going to start off very basic. Matter is made up of atoms. This is the Bohr model of an atom, which isn't accurate, but it's okay. So we like to think that an uh, atom has a nucleus in the middle with protons and neutrons and electrons. Even the word orbiting has fallen out of favor now because orbiting suggests that they're circular orbits and that they're moving in a circle. They're not, Ella, they're doing much more weird than that. Now we like to talk about energy levels or electron shells, but this will still work for the purposes of what we're doing. And it turns out when atoms bond together to form solids, they can be tightly bound to the atoms, as in covalent solids like glass. These materials are called insulators. They don't transmit electricity very well. They let charge build up, but they don't let it go anywhere. Uh, they can also be free to move around, as in metals. These will be called conductors. So most metals are very happy to pass an electron from one atom to another atom to another atom to another atom. And it turns out subatomic particles like protons, electrons, and neutrons have a property that we call charge. And it is this thing called charge that's responsible for both electricity and magnetism. It turns out we should really say electromagnetism. It's one force. Some basic facts about charge. You might know some of this, but this might have been interrupted because of your COVID experiences. Uh, there are two types of charge that we call, anybody know? You kind of know this because you know what protons are and you know what electrons are charged. Eric, positive and negative. My abrev for the word positive is a plus sign with a VE. My abrev for the word negative is a minus sign with a VE. If I just see a plus sign, I think I'm missing an equation. If I put the VE, then that's the word. That's my stupid shorthand. You can use whatever you want, positive and negative. Does anybody know what the correct units for charge are? Charge is measured in Coulombs, and the abrev is a capital letter C, named after a scientist whose last name was Coulomb. In fact, today's lesson is we're going to be looking at Coulomb's law. Mass is represented by the letter M. V, speed, velocity is represented by the letter V. What abrev do we use for charge? You might think, how about the letter C? Lowercase c is already taken for the speed of light. Uppercase c is actually something different. And so we use the letter q for a big charge or lowercase q for a tiny charge. In the same way I did big M and little m, you're going to start to notice there's a lot of mathematical similarity between how charges exert forces on each other and how masses exert forces on each other. Why Q? It's a good question. Another very important fact about charge is that, here's your word, it's quantized. And yeah, Marcus, that's where the word quantum physics comes from. What does quantized mean? It means that it comes in a fundamental smallest chunk. Our money is quantized. The smallest unit of money in the North American or in the Canadian system is the penny. If you go smaller than the penny, we don't allow it. We, we, you automatically, you round off to the nearest penny. Okay? All of our other amounts are, new, are, are, are numbers of pennies, are adding up a bunch of pennies. There is also a fundamental charge. So with money, there is the smallest unit, the cent or the penny, and any, of unit, uh, any unit of money, any amount of money, can be broken down into a certain whole number, capital N, of pennies, but never a fraction of a penny. With respect to charge, the smallest unit is called the elementary or fundamental charge. It's on your formula sheet. Go find it, please. Its symbol is lowercase e, not for electron, but for elementary charge. How big is the elementary charge, Victor? It'll be in the same section as all the uh, constants and radius, uh, th that one there. What is the elementary or fundamental charge? 
I think it starts out as 1.6. Okay, now you know where in that section where all of the data is. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. You'll probably end up memorizing that, but if not, it's on your formula sheet. All other charges are multiples of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. In other words, if you want the total charge, it's some number times E. Or if you want to know how many electrons or how many protons, it would be the total charge divided by the elementary charge. You can actually figure out how many extra protons or how many extra electrons. The charge on a proton and the charge on an electron is the same. A proton is positive 1.6 times 10 to negative 19 coulombs. An electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to negative 19 coulombs. Is that big? No. Right? Um, Technical comment, this is already out of date. After we defined the elementary charge as 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, we found that there were objects called quarks that had smaller charges of one-third E or two-thirds E, or negative one-thirds E or negative two-thirds E. Ari, and we're gonna pretend quarks don't exist. Okay. They do, but this'll work if we just pretend they don't exist. Uh, in this course, you're going to get a data page, a formula sheet. You probably saw it already. So on there, you should see in that section the elementary charges there of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. You should also see the mass of the electron is there, yes, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. Uh, the mass of a proton, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. Mass of a neutron, I might not have given you that. We don't use neutrons much because they're neutral. They don't interact that much. So I, did I give you the mass of a neutron? No. If you need it, it'll be given to you in the question. What you will need to memorize is this. So the data page doesn't explicitly list the charges of the particles, so you'll need to remember the following. Uh, electron, our brief for an electron is a lowercase e with a minus sign. Its charge is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. A proton, our abreve, is often a lowercase p with a plus sign as an exponent. Uh, its charge is positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Our abreve for a neutron is lowercase n with a zero. What's the charge on a neutron as a number exactly? It's the reason it's called a neutron. Zero. You will need to know those, but I'm hoping you've picked that up in your science and chemistry courses. All right, turn the page. Although this does not need to be memorized, you may have run, or you may have seen from Science 10, now your Science 10 was interrupted by a pandemic, but you may have seen that an alpha particle, symbol alpha, is a helium nucleus. It has two protons, two neutrons and no electrons. What's the charge on this particle? Well, two protons would be two times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, plus two neutrons would be two times zero, plus no electrons. I think it's gonna be 3.2 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So Aryan, if you know the charge on an object, if it's positive, you can figure out how many extra protons it has. If it's negative, you can figure out how many extra elect uh, electrons it has. For a conductor, which we'll look at in a couple of lessons, electrons flow easily and freely. But for an insulator, the electrons cannot flow, but they can shift slightly. This is a phenomenon known as polarization. We'll talk about that in a second. But here is the key idea, electricity, electromagnetism, Dean, it's one of the four fundamental forces. Charges exert a force on each other. And this part you will need to memorize. It says fill in the blanks, like charges will something, unlike charges will something. What do like charges do? I'm looking for a word that starts with letter R, and then an E, and then a P. And then an E. Sorry, what was that? Joanna, like charges what? 
From that alone, you can explain an awful lot about the universe. Oh, and unlike charges, Will? So if I was going to draw the direction of the electric forces in these two electrons, they would repel each other. The bottom electron would feel a force down or south. The top electron would feel a force north or up. What about here? Well, this proton would be attracted to this electron. This electron would be attracted to this proton. One of the safest places to be during a lightning storm is inside a metal car. Why? How come? Marcus, what do you think? Because it's grounded? I don't think it's grounded. Uh, many people will say, oh, Mr. Duick, it's because the tires provide insulation. Uh, that's nonsense. The lightning has just leapt a kilometer from the sky to your car. I assure you the charge can carry on and continue the 30 centimeters and get to the ground. Okay. Does anybody know why a metal car is so good to be in? Pardon me? Why is being inside a conductor so good? Joanna, like charges? That's going to be your cue for a while, so I'll be coming back to you. That'll be your line. Remember, there are no small parts, only small actors, so you've got your part. Like charges? Okay. Suppose the metal car absorbs a billion electrons, or gives off a billion electrons, because lightning can also jump upwards. Lightning can be both positive or negative, depending on the circumstances. But let's pretend it's absorbed a billion electrons. Like charges? What's the easiest way for the electrons to repel each other? They, they're stuck on the car. They can't leave the car. Where will they go? They will go all around, spread out evenly, the outside of the car. Where are you sitting? The inside of the car. Okay? So this comes out of like charges repel and the fact that a car acts like something that we call a Faraday cage. A Faraday cage is a metal cage, and you're safe inside a metal cage. It's very counterintuitive. People would say, why would you want to be inside a metal cage around electricity? Because like charges, the charges will gather on the outside of the cage. You will be on the inside of the cage and just fine. We'll write that out in just a second, but put your pencils down look up. Did you know that in this country, more people are struck by lightning than are crushed by reptiles or injured as the result of a prolonged stay in a weightless environment? Yeah, it turns out lightning really is a hidden menace. Your point being, well, well this, what happens if you're struck by lightning in a car? Oh, you'll be all right because you've got rubber tires. Not necessarily, you see, because car makers don't test for this sort of thing. So after being pelted by golf balls, Top Gear arranged for a car to be struck by lightning, with me in it. <laughs> there are very few places in the world that have the technology to blast a car with lightning. This are in Holland and Germany, but only one of those nations is laid back, liberal and fun loving enough to let me actually sit in the car whilst they hit it with 800,000 volts. Yep, it's those zany Germans. This is the Siemens High Voltage Lab in Berlin. Normally, this place builds and tests high voltage equipment for power stations and the national grid. These transformers can generate almost 2 million volts of pure electricity. But today, they're going to use that electricity for something else to make lightning. They're going to zap me and this car with 800,000 volts which is a lot. Stuff in your house runs on 240 volts. 
If it is 120 volts in North America. Hits me directly. They are cleaning away with a shovel. You might be thinking that the tires are going to protect me by insulating the car from Earth because they're rubber. Electricity can make it from the sky to the car. It can make it from the car to the ground. What's going to protect me is this, the body shell itself. Like all cars, the new Golf's body forms a Faraday cage. And a Faraday cage is something that attracts electricity and then sends it shooting around the outside so that whatever's inside shouldn't be hard. But the problem is, this isn't like brakes or airbags. Car firms don't test for lightning strikes, so I've no idea how to go. Right, my life is now in the hands of alien physics. The lightning will come out of these transformers along the wires and then shoot down to the car. Starting to raise the voltage. One thousand volts. A briefing with the scientists, and he said, "Keep my hands together towards the centre of the car and away from any metal objects." But it's a car. It's made of metal. Four hundred thousand volts. I can hear a noise. I can hear a buzzing there. You almost feel the Oh, now it's doing stuff to my car. I've got error up on the dashboard. Handbrake light flashing. <laughs> so it works. Assuming I'm not now talking to you with wings and a harp, I'm alive. Question is, is the car? Well, the electric windows work, obviously. Stereo, indicators, I mean everything. And it starts. It still works. Amazing. All because like charges repel. So, like charges repel, the charges gather on the outside of the car and you are on the inside does anybody remember the name of this what kind of cage this is good nerd trivia but you'll also see faraday cage i will go on my michael faraday rant one day but not right now one of my nerd heroes the father of electricity basically It's why uh, people that work on power lines, they wear metal-lined suits. Example five. A negative rod is brought co close to an insulating ball. The ball is first attracted and then repelled by the rod. Explain why this happens. Let me pause the video for a second. We're going to use something called a charge diagram. Now, we should point out a charge diagram. It can't show every charge because there was probably billions of electrons involved in what you just saw. Uh, can I draw billions of electrons? No. Here's what I'm going to say. This rod was charged negatively. And this ball was neutral. It had, whoop, it had let's say, two negatives. 
and two positives. Two billion negatives and two billion positives. Right when they touched, what happened? Well, those two positives were attracted to the negatives in the rod. And the negatives were repelled. So for a split second, the side that touched that little wand, that magic wand, that little, that, but we think that's the origin of magic wands, by the way, was charged sticks. Because you can see, I can make something move without touching it. Uh, it the, the one side of that ball was charged positive. And what quickly happened then is some of those electrons jumped the gap. because they wanted to get near those positives. So now, instead of uh, two electrons and two protons, maybe I have four electrons and two protons. Now, Kenta, what's the charge on the ball overall? Is the net charge positive or negative? Now it's negative, and now like charges Okay. This is charging by conduction. What does conduction mean? We came in physical contact and charges were actually transferred from one object to another. When I used to teach Science 9, I would always tell kids conduction requires contact, if you're looking for a dumb way to remember. You don't have to have contact there are now there are many ways to induce a charge charging by induction if any of you have a charging pad for your smart device for example or if any of you have an electric toothbrush all of those are charging by induction and there's various clever ways to do it but here's a fairly basic way it says this example six two uncharged metal spheres are fixed onto supports and they are touching right now they're neutral so we'll say four electro two electrons each and two protons each, four and four. A negative rod is brought into place nearby, but doesn't touch. I'm going to bring a negative rod in. What's going to happen? Well, like charges, unlike charges attract, all of the positive charges are going to move closer to the negative rod all of the negative charges are going to move away from the negative rod. And now I grab the base of the right-hand sphere and I just slide it sideways, keeping this rod in place. Now you notice I haven't touched the spheres with the rod, but now if I move these apart, I still have the same situation as before. But now I move the rod away, and Victor, what I have done is I have charged both of these spheres, one positive and one negative, and I didn't actually touch the spheres. I didn't transfer charge from this wand, from this stick to the spheres. I just rearranged the charge within them. So there is a way that you can charge an object without touching it. There are many more clever and ingenious ways, and that's becoming more and more the trend. So I have an older smartphone. My iPhone is an iX, iPhone XS or XR, I can't even remember. Uh, most of the modern ones now, I think you have a little pad you put it on to charge up, right? You don't plug it in anymore. 